Scotty Styrus. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks for having me, gentlemen. We're excited to have you. Uh, we might have had you about a week ago, but I kept sending emails to Scott Styrus instead of Scotty Styrus. Is that, is that a common theme? Uh, it is, yeah. Lots of people tend to make that mistake of leaving the Y out in my email address, and whoever's got it gets a lot of, well, at times, <laughs> important emails uh, from people, and uh, I only get half of the stuff, which is probably a good thing, actually. Just uh, yeah, they got, they got able to ignore things. Yeah, they got a couple of in depth ones from between two beers. So, yeah, whoever <laughs> is running that account, uh, yeah, nice to meet you. Um, but you've just returned from a week in Queenstown, I understand. How was that? Yeah, it was good. We have uh, one daughter, she's 15, so she's off at uh, her school water polo sort of pre season. So that meant there was just Nikki and I, and, and therefore we took the opportunity to to race down to Queenstown and have five days. So uh, that was good. The weather was tip top. So, you know, we haven't sort of missed anything. Apparently it was a bit shitty up here in Auckland. So uh, we got a little bit lucky and dodged a few bullets. And the only downside is I had to play a game of golf with her and she's just starting. <laughs> <laughs> she's right behind me. Third burger? Third burger and a little Botswana butchery? You, you hit those we two did. spots? Yeah, we did. It was our debuts as well from memory. I can't ever recall. I mean, of course, everybody knows about Third Burger, but... I can't seem to recall ever having been there before, um, but we always seem to go to Botswana. And uh, I know as a friends of uh, the guy who owns Joy Voice Steakhouse, and he gets a bit grumpy when we go to Botswana instead of instead of Joy Voice. But um, yeah, look, hey, look, it's I don't think anybody can complain. Queenstown's a, a beautiful spot, so we enjoyed our five days, and and uh, we did one of the rail trails, ran, uh, the the Roxburgh Rail Trail, and former Black Caps coach. Warren Lees, Wally Lees, was, Wally was Lees. Uh, working in the bike shop, so had a good chat to him about uh, cricket before we got underway. Delayed the inevitable of biking for seven hours, but uh, it was good fun. On your Insta, there was a Gibston Valley cricket match. Uh, how, often, <laughs> how often do you uh, roll the old arm over these days? Uh, never, never. No, I'm one of those. You, you're always, as a former player of whatever sport, you either – love it and can't get enough and you want to play as much as possible, even socially, or you are just completely done with it and you don't ever want to touch another football, a rugby ball or a cricket bat again. And I'm in the latter, so uh, I have no interest in playing backyard. I, I rolled my arm over. We were there at uh, Kirsty Stanway, who fronts uh, Sky's coverage of, of rugby, um, who's doing a great job there. So um, she was down there with her fiancé and they, they go there a bit, Gibson Valley. So we went around there for some lunch and, yeah, she wanted to have a, a bit of a go, and then Nikki got up and had a go, and um, things were getting out of hand. Started event. Yeah. Uh, the way we do things between two beers, we tell the audience how we know the guests. So Shay, how do you know Scotty Cyrus? Well, we didn't cross paths directly at Hamilton Boys, but we're both old boys of that fine institution. Um, yeah. Everybody that I have spoken to about you has said just an absolute top sportsman at school. First eleven cricket. First 11 football, first 15 rugby. You could probably find them in the first seven volleyball if they were short of a person. Um, but yeah, we did. We actually played We actually played the national volleyball final um, juniors one year, actually. So that was good fun. We lost the final to Coward Old College of all teams, but uh, we did make the final. I thought that was so, just a throwaway line, but there you go. No, 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 we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Volleyball was good fun. Um, but Steve, you might have information to the contrary on that. Yeah, that, that kind of jars with my Scotty Styrus story. So I went to Boys High too. And I remember, and I've got no idea if this is accurate or not, but it certainly stuck with me. And when I talked about you to Shay as a guest, I was like, fuck, I've got a Scotty Styrus story. And it's that Chris Kugelheim coached me at cricket when I was sort of third, fourth, fifth form. And there was always a story he told, or I think he told, my <laughs> memory's a bit hazy, about how if you're not achieving at this age, don't worry, keep pursuing it. Because Scotty Styrus, who was a star black cap at the time, he never really succeeded at school cricket. And he only really made it to second 11 level or might have only played a few games for the first 11. But now I'm hearing Shay talk and I'm wondering if that's just not true at yeah, all. It's... And if that memory somehow got faded. But is there any truth to that urban legend? Uh, well... Yeah, I was in the first 11 from the end of third form all the way through. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, and I was playing for Hamilton, the men's side, in, in sixth form. So, um, yeah, I don't know I don't know where Coogs got that from. Coogs was my, my youth New Zealand youth team coach, actually. 
which was interesting. It's some weird theories, but that's an ND Northern Districts thing. Um, but yeah, I didn't run across him. Coogs wasn't there at school when I was there. He came yeah, after. He was actually coaching me at the first eleven level. So I think there's quite a bit of myth about about Coogie's story. So that might be one of those. But yeah, at the back end of my third form year, I started playing in the first eleven. Um, all the way through to the seventh, where I actually walked away from the school first eleven team, because in those days you couldn't play in the men's comp; you had to play second grade, which I think Hamilton boys now play in the in the top grade, so everything's fine. We didn't have that; we we had to play second grade against guys really just playing for fun. And as I was in the Hamilton men's team, it wasn't really doing my development much good sitting down there at uh, at second grade playing against guys who are enjoying a beer and and you're trying to do do well. So, um, yeah, I'm going to give a big cross to Coogie on that one. Yeah, it's not the first time Coogs has fed us bum information. I think we've stopped <laughs> going to him for anything cricket-wise yeah. ever again. Coogs, if you're listening, that might be my bad memory too. I don't want to completely throw you under the bus no, there. But anyway, we'll, move, thing. we'll move on. Um, so we reached out to a number of contacts, uh, as we do, to try to get the best sort of yarns. And really bizarre, two people who do not know each other both mentioned the same story about you. And it's a really oh. niche high school story. So oh, okay. what can you tell us? No, it's all, it's all good. What can you tell us about your goal for the Boys High First Eleven football team against Otago Boys High at National Tournament? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I don't know how far we should go with some of these stories. But that, that's a plain one, so I'm okay. Take a deep breath when you start getting the story out. <laughs> and it's not what I think it's going to be. It's the same with Coogs' as the story. Um, yeah, so I hadn't played football for two years because I was, uh, as you're quite right, I played um, football growing up and all the way through. And the first 11 in my fourth and fifth forms. Um, and then I gave it up and took up rugby for the first time. So once the first 15 season finished in my last year at school, I went back and played for the first eleven soccer team, having not played football team, having not played for two years. And it was the best fun. It was the most fun I'd had playing because, you know, I guess you're not trying to train every week and you just came together for the national schools tournament. And, well, I think we came somewhere in the fifth to eighth bracket in the national tournament. And there was a guy, Mike McGarry, was coaching, uh, who, you know, he played for the Whites for, for a long time, fantastic player in his own right. Um, but I, and So it's the little things that you remember. But, um, yeah, we just tried to score a goal off the kickoff, um, which I think we did twice, actually. But, yeah, both one of those Otago boys and one was – and we might have won 1-0 as well, and that was from the kickoff and nothing else happened. But that was the goal. Well, if that's what you're talking about, yes. we, uh, yeah. we actually – yeah, we, we tried that for a couple of games because the tournament was in Wellington. You know what Wellington's like. It's just howling a gale. So it was easy to actually go over the top of the posts because it was just uh, so strong. But uh, we, we did have some fun with it. And it was. It was the most fun I've ever had on a football pitch was simply because I hadn't played for two years. And, and you, you, I guess you're playing sport for the right reasons, which was to have fun with your mates. Were all the members of the, um, the first 11 down at the tournament or did one get left behind accidentally? Mm. Did we? Did we you leave someone like, behind? You were supposed to pick Aaron Kingy up by all accounds and left him behind. Oh, that could be true, and that might not be. It is, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I don't remember that to be honest. We did drive down in our own cars, um, and I had the police on loop. So whoever was with me, I actually drove my own car, and they we listened to the one the one tape in those days. Yeah, of the police the whole way down. But I had a full car, so I can't. Have, uh, maybe maybe I was supposed to pick up Aaron King. He was he lived just around the corner from me, so mm. there's a strong chance you're right. But he's still waiting. <laughs> it could be. It could be. Um, <laughs> just just to hang around, yeah. So we, for, for the audience that perhaps didn't pick that up, Scotty Styra scored a goal from the kickoff, chipped the keeper, the fastest goal ever recorded at national tournament by two accounts. Two people reported back on that, that particular piece of information. So well done, Scotty. Um, just hanging in on the high school stuff for a second. The nickname that you got from a teacher, I think it was Chris Carver at Boys High. Now, uh, is Pig Dog, is that, is that a name which is appropriate for a teacher to be nicknaming a student? <laughs> well, I don't remember. Yeah, well, I mean, it could have been him. I've got no idea of where, where it came from. I actually remember it from a football training when it was so boggy and the fact that I don't exactly have the darkest skin um, and it was um, 
just basically a, a mud pile that had been raining all day. We had our football training. And that was where I first remember it coming from. But Chris Carver was the teacher, you're right. But he was a uh, rugby man. He was, he, he was in charge of, Yeah, he was in charge of the first 15 and Northern Regions Rugby and all of those. So, look, he may have come up with it and said it to someone else. I don't know. But, um, yeah, that's the first I've heard of it coming from him. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was where I first remember. It was a football training in the mud, basically. And my, my you know, lack of tan got me in the end. Uh, and it just looked like a pig rolling around in the, in the, in the mud. It seems like we're looking the lid on a lot of Scott Styrus history. It's some true, some not true in the first yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of very <laughs> niche Hamilton boys hiking as well. So let's, let's back out of uh, Peach Grove yeah. Road and head back into the cricket career. Um, well, no, actually, let's stay, let's stay in the high school because I want to know what Scott Styrus was like as a teenager. What, what were you like sort of academically away from the sport field? What, what was your character like uh, growing up in those boys high days? <laughs> uh, academics didn't really come into it. And my wife's now laughing at me. Um, but yeah, academics didn't come, in, come into it for school. You know, I, mean, I don't remember at school where I, I'm assuming it's the same for everyone around New Zealand as well. But you start off being streamed, you get sort of put in, in classes that they believe to be where you are academically. And I did start off in the higher, sort of supposedly brainier classes, but then just went down, 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 and further down. And in the end, I didn't, I'm not sure I passed the subject in my, in my last year of, uh, of school. We had, I mean, we had so much sport to play that um, I, I don't think I had a, a full week at school attending classes until the middle of the year. So it was a bit of a dog's breakfast for me academically. Um, and therefore, I actually went out and got a real job, which to this day is still my last real job, which I did for two and a half years at ASB Bank, at one of the banks as a bank teller, which was awesome, actually. I loved it. But, uh, yeah, that, that was solely because there were not a lot of academics being done in the Styrus household, from my perspective anyway. But uh, personality-wise, well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't thought about it too much. I think, you know, just like probably you guys and everybody else, and you just get outside and play in the backyard and you play with your neighbours and play some football, kick a ball around, play some cricket, play some rugby, play some bull rush, play some whatever, and... and and that's all you live for, just to have a bit of fun. And that's sort of memories anyway of, of growing up. It was just probably the same as most New Zealand kids um, because of the fact that we do have before devices, no phones to play on, no uh, Xbox or PlayStation. We just got outside and, and ran around and then came back in when it was time for dinner. But I think that's probably a, a story true for, for everybody. Was there any pressure? I mean, obviously you carved an incredibly successful sporting career and to do that, requires sacrifice and discipline and, and intelligence. Was there any pressure from home when the academics started to trail off that you should be focusing on that? Or, or was that not, not really an issue? Oh, no, no huge pressure. Yeah, because um, uh, nobody had ever been to university from my family um, on my mum or dad's side. So my father had sort of made it his life's mission. He said, well, I'm, I'm going to change this. This is my kids aren't going to be like that. You know, you're either going to university or you're going to get a trade and, um, you know, become a, a labourer of some sort. And, and therefore, that was his goal. So when I went, you know, didn't do that well at school in the back half and then didn't go down, didn't go to university and didn't get a trade and started playing sport, he, he really hated it. He couldn't handle it at all. Um, and to the point where even in the early days when I started playing, it was pretty much amateur cricket, even though you, you got a token, a little bit amount of money, but... You know, I could, I, which I did, I could play a season of first-class cricket for Northern Districts and still be under the threshold to be on the dole and take the, the unemployment benefit for $80 a week. I think you can earn up to $80 a week. I could do that by playing first-class cricket. And he didn't, he didn't like that fact. So there was a huge amount of pressure to, uh, to, to go to university and do well in studies. So thankfully for me and for our, my relationship with my father, he was even, uh, my younger brother did go to university. So he he did break the mould, if you like, and, and go on. Uh, and that took the pressure off. And he could then, um, I guess, later on when I started travelling around the world, he could actually follow me around. And that that side of things um, just slowly dissipated a little. It's a real interesting, for, for younger people that are listening to this podcast, we had DJ Forbes on a couple of episodes as well, who sounds like he trod quite a similar path to you, where he left school, got a job in a bank, and then yep. juggled, juggled his sporting ambitions with a full-time career. 
that's obviously not really the career path for aspiring top level athletes, student athletes now. Um, yeah. And the thing that DJ was sort of saying was that the life skills and, and the things that it teaches you that, that stood him in good stead for a sporting career. Well, I mean, I, I was the same age in the same year at school as Jonah Lomu, who we all know, you know, world great rugby player. And he went to ASB Bank as well, straight from school. And in his case, he was obviously a big superstar. So he had this uh, big, you know, press around it. But there were benefits to it. Now, whilst we were paid like amateurs to, to actually play uh, cricket in those days, um, the bank would actually pay me full time and I would have the summer off to go and play Oh, wow. First class, first class cricket. And I, so, yeah, with full pay. But then the second year uh, that I did that, it was no pay, but you still got the time off. And then the third year, it was like, well, I'm not sure we can do this anymore. But, uh, you know, those sorts of things don't happen anymore. I, I think it was quite common back then. I remember the stories of some of the All Blacks who uh, would work for Coca-Cola or some of the other brands and barely turn up to work. They'd get a full sort of paycheck, but they were able to train and, and try and be as good a players as they could be. So that was one of the benefits when you when I did start this is ASB Bank were very good like that. Um, but you know, there's only so far that can go because the other staff were getting a bit antsy about it naturally that, that that's what's happening. Do you think that real world experience improved you as a cricketer? Like do you think if, if Scotty Styrus was thrown into the high performance type environment now? you would have been better at aspects or, or is that sort of balance of knowing what the real world's like, that perhaps motivation of you not wanting to do that and wanting to be a cricketer? Do you think that's sort of well, balance? <laughs> well, you know, this can be quite a deep question, isn't it? I'm not sure you want to go as philosophical as what this possibly could be, but, um, you know, it's that whole argument about getting, and you see a lot of sports do it today and I don't agree with it at all. They're getting into these academies early. You must train for, you know, 20 hours a week. I, I mean, I saw something on TV about the Hamilton Boys High First 15 now training eight times a week and you're just sitting there going, what? You know, we were a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, which was a lot like a lot of, you know, professional sides in those days. So things have, things have changed. But I think, you know, I wouldn't change the fact that I was able to go out and play many sports. You know, you could go and play football, play rugby, play cricket. But you can't do anything like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so part of that too is if you get into that system, you don't get that real world experience you're talking about. You know, I, yes, it was four. I loved every minute of those two and a half years working for ASB Bank because I knew nothing about the real world. And all of a sudden, I'm trying to sell insurances, retirement plans, um, mortgages, et cetera, to, to everyday people. And so you actually learn what the real world's like. You learn how best you can manage your finances if you needed to. Um, and, you, you know, you just had to. I guess, realised that there was more to the sport than simply playing. Now, I was fortunate I played professionally for 20 years, but the fact is that at any point I had learnt some life lessons and the, and the fact that when we had 18 and 19-year-olds coming in, you just knew that they didn't know anything. So I think there's a lot to be said for uh, some of that real-world experience early on. That's a really good answer. And just uh -huh. for your info, we're keen for you to go as deep and as philosophical as you want. <laughs> is that yeah. better, by the way? I've got some fancy machine here and I forgot to turn it on. It's getting a bit beautiful dark. Is that too light for you? Lighting. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful lighting. Beautiful lighting. Um, right, we've got a few other bits and pieces from people we went to about Scotty Styrus. So BJ Watling, uh, yep. former <laughs> cat, great. Yep. BJ says, Scotty was ruthless with card games when we were younger. Absolute stickler for the rules. And if you broke them, you lost. So we learned pretty quickly you had to be switched on around him or it would cost us. So I can imagine young B, young quiet BJ comes in and being a stickler for the rules, is that sort of controlling the environment or is that a bit of hazing or is that, how do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I, like, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with him actually, they're a stickler for the rules. I'm always looking to cheat. I've always, <laughs> had that, I've always had that motto, if you're not cheating, you're not trying and it still comes out today. So I'm not sure. <laughs> how weird BJ's memory comes from that. Um, so I think, no, 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 it's no hazing or anything like that. I just think you were just looking to win. And, and cricketers are, are gamblers by nature. Um, some of the tours in the past have been long. So, you, you know, it's not like rugby where you just play on a, a weekend and you might have three or four games and you're out. Some of these, the longest tour I ever went on was four and a half months uh, through five countries. So sometimes when you, and your partners weren't allowed to, to come on tour at that time. So, you know, you're, in third world countries and you can't go outside and whatever. So things like cards or even darts, pool, all of those things come into it um, to keep yourselves occupied and, and sane. 
Uh, I'm, I am competitive. Uh, it's fair to say. I, I'd be surprised if any of your guests who came on said they weren't competitive as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably competitive to a fault, to a point where I've banned myself from all sports these days because mm-hmm. uh, I just find myself <laughs> getting into trouble. Um, so uh, I can, I'd say it's probably more that than, than uh, hazing or stickler for the rules. It's just um, trying to win in whatever way you can. That uh, craziness on tour leads quite nicely into our next uh, little bit. <laughs> so Jimmy Pammon, who was your coach at ND, he said about you, brilliant team man, great support to me in my first year head coaching ND. Apart from going out of his way to muck up every warm-up drill we did, top man, excellent cricket brain, among the best I've worked with. One of the funniest things I witnessed was a wrestling match with Anton Devsit in the bar of Novotel in Wellington. Anton did draw blood, but somehow Scott claimed victory. Now, we had Anton on this podcast, and oh, he has if- given us his version of events, which Shay is going to play now. I'm going to, through the magic of technology, I'm going to, uh, hopefully this audio comes through loud and clear. I can tell you it won't be true. It's one of Storis's little nicknames but yeah that's the way it goes i, I got star Storis is a um Storis is a bit of a punchy guy on the boot he, he gets a little bit obviously he's got a bit of weight to go around so he uh he gets a bit punchy punchy on the booze and a bit wrestly on the booze but you know it, there was one one day there's one day in the um, we we're in wellington and he got a bit punchy on the booze and one of one of us Got up with blood coming out of their lip, and and it, and it was it was a guy with a lesser tan that, that had a little bit of. Light. <laughs> now that's that's um, Anton's that's Anton's version of events. Now this is your episode. You have the yeah. right of, of rebuttal. And a little a little addition to this, uh, yeah. on your Instagram feed there was a, there was a photo of you with some blood, and I think your daughter, and Pamant piped in, and then Devsitch jumped on, and then me on the Between Two Bears Instagram account. <laughs> Jumped in as well, saying we've heard fifty percent of the story. Would you like to come on and share the rest? So now it's well, uh, yeah. I, I, you haven't heard fifty percent of the story. There was, there, I'm not even sure there was any alcohol involved. It wasn't a bar, yes, but it was at the hotel, and we, it was at seven o'clock at night or thereabouts, and we were just about to go out for dinner. But you, you know what Anton's like? He's a Croatian, and he's he's always looking for a fight, and he's always said, "I can take you down. I'll take you down. Come on, just say I'll take you down whenever you want." And I don't know why or how, but it was like, all right, let's go. So we wrestled in the bar and I locked him up and, and pinned him and started saying to him, enough, have you had enough? All right, it, this is, you've just been destroyed. Everybody's watching. So this is not a, a, a one-on-one. You could go elsewhere. So Brilliant. what does he do? He grabs my nuts and starts squeezing them as hard as he could. I release, which I released him at that point, And that's when... He starts wrestling and he gets me because of the fact that he's just uh, gone below the belt and, and and he believes that that's fair. He says openly, he said, that's, you know, look, that's there are no rules. If you, you've got to win, you've got to win. And that's the way I beat you. And at the end of the day, I beat you. But he was pinned down. He, he was dead. He was gone. Uh, and I'm interested to hear that he didn't mention that part of the story in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> But uh, I always thought if you're going to have a bit of a, a bit of a, a friendly go-to, that you, that part of your body would be out of bounds. But it doesn't seem so for the for the little Croatian. Sounds like you are a stickler for the rules, then. <laughs> well, yeah, perhaps you know maybe you're right. <laughs> but um, yeah, he, he was always going. He would have been going on about trying to have a have a bit of fun, a bit of a go for about four or five years, I reckon. Because, yeah. uh, you know, he fancy, he's quite feisty. He loves his rugby. He wants to be – I think he wanted to be – Anton wanted to be a, a rugby player before he was a cricketer, so he enjoyed the, the aggressive side of things. But, yeah, one thing he was right, and I will concede this, I did have a slight weight advantage on him. So it wasn't <laughs> that hard to pin him down. It wasn't anything special, it must be said, because he's probably about, I don't know, 80 kilos dripping wet. <laughs> That's generous. Well, actually, no, he's probably yeah, out a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I think you're yeah. right. I'm glad we got your side of the story there. I think we can we can close the close the bottom on, on that little list. Yeah. Um, but what what about the the first bit that Jimmy talked about going out of your way to muck up his warm up drills? Is that just the Scotty Slyra sense of humour, or is there more to that? No, uh, it, it was there was more to that as well. I, I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily the only one, but that's not an excuse. It was more 
um, you, you always hear cricketers say the moment they start hating warm-ups is when they're slightly on the way down. They're ready to go and they're ready to move out of the game. Now, I was always a believer that once you got over the line and you're, you're on the field, that's when you're ready to play. Warm-ups were exactly that. Warm-ups, you're there to warm the body up to get ready to play. Whereas some others, and it's usually younger players, and this is where I understood Jimmy's, um, Jimmy's point, is that younger players don't quite know how they want to prepare and, and their preparation for a match might start an hour and a half before the day's play. But I've played 300 games and, uh, you know, you're just going through the motions of a warm-up, making sure the body's loose and you, and you have that ability because you've played for so long to then step onto the field and you're, you're ready to, to get into the contest. So, again, you know, I think some maybe he's reading a bit much into it, but, I mean, I had this discussion with, with Grant Bradburn about – and then there are some senior guys. We had the Marshall twins with us, the two Marshall twits, and, you know, James was incredible at, at wanting to make sure he's methodical and ready to warm up to play, and yet Hamish was the opposite. He would muck around and, and try and ruin the games for everybody as well. So, yeah, it's, you know, some people just had figured out – when to, to switch on and switch off. Um, Jimmy Pammett, who's you know terrific coach, who's doing well as well at the moment, um, I could understand his point um, because there there are other guys who can't quite work that out. And I mean, does it happen in football as well? Do guys take uh, you know their warm ups incredibly seriously, and others just wanted to? They knew that the game hadn't started and they didn't really worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was going to say it's exactly the same. It's regardless of what the sport is, when you've got when you've reached a level where you've played so many games, you know your process. It's it's a little bit different. But what I find fascinating about hearing you say that is the for most people the 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 experience is just through the television screen. So they don't they don't see the behind the scenes, the personalities, the different things, the way that a team um, needs to blend and to come together. So it, it's fascinating that kind of coaching side, how you, you get those personalities to all perform. Cause it was a very successful period of cricket that Jimmy was, uh, was at the helm of, I think you went to the, the world T20 yeah. club. What yeah. you might've got the, the terminology wrong, but you, I think you won it as That's well, a, didn't you? Uh, we, we had a champions league, um, which was the last year they had it actually. So you had to win your, uh, your national T20 comp and then you would, uh, yeah, qualify to go off to, to India. Uh, it was the last year they had it. And, uh, yeah, we did well, actually. We beat the South African champs. We beat the Pakistan champs, the Sri Lankan champions. I think we might have beaten the Mumbai Indians as well. And we, um, and we had still quite a few players away, Dan Vittori's, the Corey Andersons. Um, but we had, you know, obviously class players like BJ and, and Kane um, and Trent and Tim Southey. Um, so plenty of guys there. It was, it was a lot of fun because that was when I basically retired straight after that. So it was, uh, it was good to go out on the world stage with ND, who I'd started with 20 years before that. Uh, and you're right, Jimmy was the coach and he, he did a fantastic job because he's, I know he had a lot of good players there, uh, but we hadn't been there before and it was good to get over to India and, and get amongst it, some of the world's best. So just to move away slightly, um, there was a Black Clash uh, game last weekend, uh, big success. Yep. There was an article in the spin-off uh, in the week leading up to the game. Uh, author yep. Callum Henderson, he wrote about the 11 New Zealand cricket legends I most want to see in the Black Clash. So number one, <laughs> Mark Breakbatch. Number two, Brian Young. Number three, Jesse Ryder. Jesse Ryder. Number four, Scotty Styrus. And this is what uh, Callum penned. He said... It's no coincidence the Black Caps transformation into the nice guys of international cricket took place after the retirement of Scott Styrus, an opponent so annoying that Mitchell Johnson once tried to headbutt him even though he was wearing a helmet. It is that, exactly this kind of adversarial attitude that he's been selected to bring to the squad, however jarring and unnecessary it may seem. So I want to talk about that incident um, and to set the scene of the a one-day international between New Zealand and Australia in Napier in 2010, it was, and things got quite heated between you and Mitchell Johnson. Are you able to tell us your side of, of that story? <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's the first, actually, he's actually the first guy I've ever seen defend Mitchell Johnson in this, so <laughs> it, it, it's an interesting take, I'll, I'll, I'll give him that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating one that, that I get asked about it a lot. I guess it's probably the number one thing I get asked about, people want to know. Um, it was it was fascinating because I'd been injured and came back into the squad. I'd been playing well domestically, but uh, there's a huge diff jump between our domestic comp, well, there was at the time, and the international stuff. So even though I'd been playing well, I came back into the squad, and we named the team the night before, as always happens, and I wasn't in it, myself and Nathan McCullum. Um, 
were left out. And then on the morning of the game, Daniel Vittori got injured. And so he was then out. I think it was, uh, yeah, it must have been Vittori. And, well, it, naturally, the like-for-like -like replacement would be spinner for spinner. Nathan McCullum would come in for Dan Vittori, but I think Dan might have been captain even at that time. And therefore, Ross Taylor took over and Ross just went, no, I want Scott playing. So I, somehow I got the nod to play. I wasn't even due to play in that game. Um, and then I go out to bat and, you know, as I say, the jump was quite a big one. And I was, I felt like I was floundering, wasn't going anywhere. I, I didn't know, well, I had to score quickly. I didn't know where that was going to happen from or come from. And then out of the blue, and I'd never had a run in with Mitchell Johnson before. He's, he's actually a really, really nice guy. And I didn't understand why he decided, but he stood at the top of his mark. He only had two balls to go. And he started pointing at his head. And I thought, well, either he thinks I'm a nutcase, which is highly <laughs> possible, or he's going to try and hit me in the head. So I took a punt and went for that. And I was basically standing there like a baseballer waiting for it. Um, and he did. He Sure enough, he ran in and bowled short. He didn't. I don't think he had to. And to this day, I believe if he just finished his last two, last two balls, I would have carried on floundering around and we wouldn't have got up and won it. But, um, you know, he, all of a sudden a contest and that's where – I've always, in those battles, sort of probably played my best. So he went looking for a fight, and then I obliged it in a way because I, I slogged it away for four, and I ran past him and I said um, something like, uh, I don't know who you think you are, but you're not that good. And and then he said something. But then, and I promise you, from that point on, whatever he said and whatever I said, I have no memory of it. I can't recall what was said. But the next ball, the same thing happened, and I ran down the wicket. And we were on the same line as each other. And so I sort of pulled my shoulder in to go around him. And then he stuck his arm out to try and have a little bit of a nudge. And I went around him okay. But then when I turned and came back, we were once again in the same, in the same line. And he's done the same. He stuck his arm out. So this time I thought I'll go straight through it. So we sort of bunted shoulders, which I think you see on the, on the TV. And at that point we turned around. And then it was just a lot of rubbish basically said um, between him and I. And again, I don't even remember. What, what I do remember is Ricky Ponting came running in from, from point saying, I saw you, you F this and you, but he did that. And so I told him he could <laughs> fuck off as well, basically. And, uh, and that was that. We ended up winning the game, thankfully. Um, and we went off to Eden Park. Now, uh, I mean, I, asked, I was playing with Mike Hussey, um, you know, the, the fantastic Australian player at, at Chennai in the IPL. And so I asked him, I said, what was the team meeting like after, in between that game with Mitchell Johnson and the next one when we went to Eden Park? And he said, well, your name came up. And Ricky Ponting, said, Ricky Ponting just said, I don't care which of you bowlers do it. I just want one of you to fucking kill him. And that was, <laughs> and said, that was their full scouting report um, on what they were going to do. And we got to that game and, and I just coincidentally had to face Mitchell Johnson first up when I went out to bat. And, uh, you know, he bowled the speed of light. I promise you it was quick. He bowled me a bump, bounce a first ball. And I just had time literally just to drop the head down and hope that it didn't hit me. It was uh, – it went over Brad Haddon's head, actually. I think it went for, for five wides or, or whatever. But he bowled – he had a really good series, and I ended up having a really good series too. And at the end, you know, you shook hands and you, and you moved on, which is what should happen. Um, and we've, we've actually had to work a little bit around the world um, together and he's been great as I say he's one of the uh, you know, so he's one of those guys who gets white line fever he, he gets across the line and he, he sort of amps himself up but he's a genuinely nice guy and um, pretty quiet and placid as well which most people probably won't believe <laughs> having, having never played cricket myself that yeah. whole or like having watched a lot, a lot of it though that whole mentality of you know you've, you've hit a bowler there's obviously tension in the air and then the next delivery is going to come down. Do you zone out, or like are the balls tightening up, and you're thinking, "Shit, this could come up. This could be a beamer." Is there like a like a, a conscious stream of thought, or do you just go into flow and whatever happens happens? Well, again, it's your personality, right? I mean, uh, some guys really look for a confrontation, and I was probably one of those. Um, others try to avoid any sort of confrontation. Um, someone like Kane Williamson, you know. The, Obvious, obviously quality player that he is. He never gets involved in any of that. He just gets into his own bubble. And, you know, if this sort of thing happened, he, would, he wouldn't engage whatsoever. So it's just down to who you are more than, more than anything. Uh, 
and especially the quicker bowlers, you don't want to get them angry because um, a lot of people probably don't realise how quick it is at those those big boys, the Brett Lees, the Showback guys, Shane Bond, even Lockie Ferguson around now uh, from New Zealand. They're, uh, they're just seriously quick. So you don't want to anger the, those guys because some of them can be a bit nasty. And, and you're right, let one go and, and it'd be a flat one straight at your head. Uh, a couple of the West Indies, or one in particular, was like that. He, he always went looking for fights and if you, if you got a bit tasty with him, then he would just go straight at your head and that's when it can get dangerous and it'd be... Uh, so he was one you don't certainly look to engage. You know, of the players today, Virat Kohli from India, you know, he just goes looking for fights, basically. Not, you know, not physically, physical fights or starts swearing at people and carrying on. He, he just wants to... And can remain calm when he's when he's amped up, which is quite a rare thing actually. If um, for a player to be able to be as good as he is and get that emotional roller coaster, because usually the really best guys just are, just are even keel. Their the emotions don't don't change whether they're going well or going poorly. Just to loop back to the black cat clash, though, you played in that, right? You played in twenty twenty one. Not uh, last year, I did yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. was a mess. That was not yeah. good. <laughs> I had, yeah, that wasn't good. I had, um, so it must have been on Saturday, was it? I mean, on Thursday night, I had an impromptu barbecue. I got home at 1 a.m., not, not good, worse for wear. And I had to do a live TV show into India at 3 a.m. Um, so I did that steaming. Um, <laughs> and then, as I did it at 3, went to about whatever, quarter past 4, and then I was up at 6.30 the next morning, flew to Christchurch for the Black Clash, um, dropped our bags off and went straight to the Lawn Bowls Club where we started drinking down there at midday. So I'd had about an hour of sleep after a heavy night. That went all the way through to one o'clock the next morning. And then we had training the next day. I didn't make it. I didn't get to the Black Clash training. I got out of bed at 4.30 in time to go to the ground. Um, and... Yeah, uh, and then it carried on that night as well. So I, 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 I'm not sure the black clash is for me, actually. I wasn't there this year. But <laughs> <laughs> either that or I might need to take it a little bit more quietly. And not but get so, must, uh, there must be some excitement in the air when old teammates and people get together yeah. and it is, it is a jovial atmosphere. It must be one of the highlights of f- former players' kind of summers if they get invited. Yeah, look, I think the... You're exactly right. I mean, uh, you spend a lot of time with these guys. We talked earlier about how long tours are and you, you've got a, you know, you spend a lot of time socially with these guys. So it's, it was great to catch up with everybody. Um, there's some I still chat to all the time, but there's, there's others you, you see infrequently when you go around the country and that's it. So, you know, for example, I hadn't seen Adam Perori who played for, I reckon, 15 years, you know. So it was good to, to catch up to him and with him and see what he's up to. And a lot of that, a lot of that's, um, the, the byproduct, I know that the game itself is why everyone's together, but you're 100% right. From a cricket perspective, you're catching up with everybody that you haven't seen for a while or, in this case as well, the rugby boys who you, who you may or may not know. You know, when I was playing, you, you knew the rugby players around the country. You just, you'd often be at similar events. But the players now, you know, I don't have any real uh, clue as to who they are. So it was it was a lot of fun to, you know, to find out a little bit more about Geordie Barrett or, or Will Jordan or those sorts of guys, as well as uh, catch up with your mates from, from days gone by. That was one of the, <clears throat> the entertaining, the fun aspects of the Black Clash this year, was seeing sort of amateur guys who hadn't played in a long time facing bonding, who could mm. still really fire it down. And it reminds me, I was, I was having coffee this afternoon with a friend who had that experience with you. You, you wouldn't rem- remember him. Um, but he was like, I remember mean, Scotty Styrus bowling to me when we were young. Gav Douglas, he's a Nobody. He's a nobody. He's a nobody. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was like, it's cricket's one of those games that you actually get fear. There's not that many games. You can be shit at sports and not be afraid. But if you're a bit mm. uncertain as a batsman and you've got someone really firing it down, there's that sort of shit yourself factor, which leads me into my next point about you being, I think Nasser Hussein described you as a street fighter. Um, and we're talking about like the, the mental warfare, sort of a strength of your game, your personality. Um, and I've heard you talk about there were two times in your Black Caps career where whether it was you or the team sort of targeted players to try to get inside their heads. And they were both South Africans. Are you able to talk to us about uh, Graham Smith and uh, Faf Duplessis? 
well, both of them, again, it's, it's quite incredible. Uh, uh, terrific guys. I mean, I played with Fuff um, in the, the IPL with CSK, with Chennai. Um, which, oh, I'll get onto that in a minute. Graham Smith was um, a, he was a terrific captain. He was a, an amazing batsman as well. But when he came into the side, there was some tension in the South African team around the older players, um, and he, they had this young 22 come in and be captain. And so you could just, as an opposition, you could sense that there was a, a bit of um, animosity or there was some issues in their group. So um, Stephen Fleming sort of said, right, we're going to go after Graham Smith. And, and try and alienate him. And in those days, he was, I mean, his nickname was Biff because he just, and he's a, he's a big man. He's six foot five and he's a, you know, really wide. He's a, he's a typical South African. And, you know, he just looked for a fight all the time, which is, you know, I've worked so much with Graham uh, over the last few years in India and he's really placid and timid and, and a hell of a nice bloke as well. And, and that was the complete opposite when he first came in, into that South African side. So Stephen Fleming decided it, and he, he had a go at, at Graham Smith. And he barely got one line out. And he didn't, you know, again, people think you stand there and you're swearing, you're F this and whatever. None of that really happens. But he had a go at him. And, and it wasn't too much other than the fact that he took so long to, to face up. You know, we weren't getting through the overs in time and he was taking forever. It was something as simple as that. And it was like, like a bomb had gone off in his head. He just lost it completely and he was out not long after. And so for someone like him, that works. There are other players we talked earlier about, Virat Kohli. You don't want to engage them because that makes them better. In those early days, you could get after Graham Smith. And that was the first time I'd seen really in a team meeting at the international level where you said, right, we're going to target this guy. Uh, and in that case, it worked as we got him out and end up winning that test match, which I think still might be the only one we've won here in New Zealand. Um, but with Fuff, yeah, that was another one because that was the World Cup in, in 2011. Uh, they were the number one. Um, we just got through to the quarters. They were the number one side, I think, at that point. And they had this guy, Fuff Duplessis, who you know, cricket fans will know who he is now. But at the time, he'd played like four games. And he came out in the media and said, I'm the, I'm the, I know my game better than any 26-year-old in the world. Um, we, you know, we, are, we are the best team here. We know that if we play well, we're going to – we're – We'll take care of everybody. And we're all sitting there thinking, Who, who's this bloke? Who the hell is Buff Duplessis? And then, you know, we, we knew that he was best mates with A.B. de Villiers growing up and he'd sort of been forgotten a little bit. A.B. had gone on to have this amazing career and he was a late, late developer. And so we decided, again, as a, as a, <laughs> as a team, that we were going to get into Fuff. Um, and then just to perfectly, he, he ran out A.B. de Villiers one or two balls into his innings, which meant that he was then isolated in the middle by himself um, and the guys just came in and, and from all directions and started giving it to him. Um, and including that, and it's still the funniest thing, I've not seen anything since, Kyle Mills, who was the 12th man, just sprinted from the sideline uh, and actually elbowed him in the face with a, um, pretending to hand a drink bottle to, <laughs> to one of the other guys, clocked him in the jaw um, and got fined 120% of his match fee, and he wasn't even <laughs> playing in the game. Um, but um, I, I, I didn't get anything, um, and the reason for that, uh, yeah, was, um, I, well, no, I probably shouldn't say the reason why, but uh, I was lucky enough to get off, I didn't say, and I didn't get charged or anything, but you know, I did climb in. But the thing was, is on the field, I was talking with Fuff even while he was out there, because literally a week later, we were teammates for the first time at, at Chennai in the IPL, and and we knew that we were going to have to be um, sharing the same dressing room. We were going to be sitting next to each other or chatting a lot uh, for the next two months. And, um, you know, he's a fantastic, fantastic guy. When we got together at Chennai, there was Tim Southey who'd been playing and who was right in the thick of it and myself. Uh, and then, of course, they had Alvi Morka, another South African too. So we all went out for dinner in Chennai straight after this bust up with Fuff. Um, and there wasn't a lot said for the first, I don't know, maybe – 20 minutes of that dinner uh, because there was still a little bit of animosity. Buffett, he got fined and uh, Tim might have got fined where he was certainly in the middle of it all. But, you know, those were the, the only two times. People think sledging is a, a huge part of international cricket where, you, you know, you're going after people personally. Nothing like that happened. Um, these are the only two instances that I can recall. Both worked in our favour, um, but they were few and far between. And I was there for 12 years and that was about it. it it's... Um... I'd, I'd love to be the banter, it seemed. Like, you've got to be kind of quick. Who who was a teammate that you played with or against who had the quickest or the best banter on the field? 
Oh, Shane, Shane Warne was, was number one. Um, he, and you just didn't take him on. I, I tried not. I tried to avoid it. And the worst part with Warney is that, you know, you knew if he thought you were rubbish, then he would just come after you. And he always came after me. And the only time where that wasn't the case was when I was playing in the Big Bash in Australia. And we had George Bailey, who was the captain of Australia, I think, or was about to be. And Shane Warne just thought George wasn't good enough to be captain of Australia. So he focused all his attention on George, which was ridiculous because George Bailey was a terrific cricketer. Uh, it was just one of those players, like he does with his commentary now, he sort of gets into certain players that he doesn't think are very good. So that was, you know, he was number one. He was so quick. I, I, if I knew I was playing against Warney three months in advance, I would think of all these little things that I thought were funny and they were, I was ready to go and I'd pull them out and then he'd come straight back at me and I had nothing to follow up with. It would take me, I wasn't quick enough or smart enough uh, to think of anything witty to, to have a go at him. Um, there was just the one time where it was, I knew it was going to be the last time I ever played against Shane Warne and I was just ready to fly in on him and let him have it and walked out onto the field and he just came up to me and said, G'day Scott, how are you? Nice to see you. How's the family? I thought, he's just done me through <laughs> kindness. It's the first and only time he's ever been kind uh, on the cricket field and that was the day I was really going to let, let, let fly. But um, he, he was number one. You just didn't. You know, he was so good, skillful, um, had a, a really good cricket brain. And so he could he could talk a lot of rubbish and then back it up with skill and he'd get people outside their game. So and from New Zealand's perspective, Tim Saudi is very quick, so you don't take him on in, uh, in any sort of banter. But uh, on a cricket field, Shane Warne was number one. We'd love to get Tim on the pod, Tim, if you're listening. We'll come and yeah. meet to your house. Um, is there, I know we've, we've pinpointed a few prickly moments which perhaps don't give a fair representation of your time, but is, is it a fair representation that like the black caps now are like the nice guys and they play by the rules and they're very fair, whereas perhaps your era was a bit more grisly and a bit more mental warfare, or is that not really that accurate? No, I think you're, I think you're right. Um, it, the, I mean, the first thing I thought of when you read that article or that uh, that little blurb a little earlier was, you know, we must have we must have won the Spirit of Cricket Award three or four or five times when I was playing. Um, so you know, either everybody else was worse than us, or <laughs> or they or they felt sorry for us and gave it to us out of sympathy and pity. Um, but I think you're still right with what you said. I think it's just a personality thing. We had a lot of bristly characters, you know, more abrasive uh, naturally than what the team does now. I mean, I, um, it's, you know, the, the guys back then were nice guys, but they were just more aggressive with the way they played the game. They were more aggressive just with their own personalities than what the current group are. Um, you know, I wouldn't like to see the group today who are, you know, I think the best New Zealand side that I, ever, I wouldn't like to see them try and play that aggressive sort of prickly way that was played 20, 30 years ago. It, just as I wouldn't like to see that team try and play you know the the nice guy because both it would be false for both groups of um, groups of people and and the teams that were around. I mean the eighties were worse. They, I mean those guys hated each other. The New Zealand teams of of, of that era they were very good and, and did well on, on the world stage. But you know they um, they didn't really get on with each other. It's fair to say. Uh, so there's you know there's, there's been a history of abrasive teams that have been both successful and and not so successful. Um, and, and this is one of those teams that's just a little bit more passive, uh, doing the, all the right things, but that's also the personality that they are. I'm going to change tack here slightly. Um, I had the pleasure of chatting to your wife, uh, Nikki, uh, yesterday, to give us a little bit of background and detail on some bits and pieces. Um, and she told me with good detail the story of the first time you met, 3rd of January 2004. Uh, I'd love to hear your version of uh, what happened that day and that night, and I can sort of compare and contrast with, with what she told us. What do you remember? Uh, this must be the first date that we were going on. I mean, well, no, no actually it wouldn't have been. 3rd of January was we played Pakistan, and uh, and Nikki's sister was actually going out. This is, if you can follow this, Nikki's sister was going out with Kyle Mills's flatmate. Okay, so, um, yeah, so Kyle Mills' flatmate, I think it was his birthday from memory. So they were out celebrating. We'd beaten Pakistan at Eden Park and we all went out as well. So his, Kyle's flatmate was catching up with Kyle um, and the two groups sort of came together and, and that's where I met her. And 
uh, you know, we organised because we were then were off the next day and we were going to go and uh, carry on the, the tour of us Pakistan around around New Zealand. Uh, and when I got back to Auckland, however many couple of weeks later or whatever it was, we were supposed to go out on our first date. And all of the guys went and played uh, golf at Titarangi. Um, and I ended up being incredibly lucky with a hole in one, and which caused me to have to stay in the bar. And there was, a, there was actually a Lions Club meeting of about 150 people <laughs> in the clubhouse, and I've got to go in and shit everybody a drink, so, which is, you know, customary. I think they have insurance for all that sort of thing now, but, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> I had to go and shout everybody. And that meant that Titterangi is quite a way away from the centre of Auckland and it took, I was 45 minutes late. And so she was standing out outside the hotel on the side of the road, dressed up naturally because she's going to go out on a date with me. Um, and uh, she was waiting for 45 minutes and, and was pretty angry by the time I got there. And I tried to tell her, look, you know, it's my first hole in one. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, this, this doesn't happen. I should have been home two hours ago and I would have been if there uh, if this hadn't have happened, but she didn't really see it that way. And, and I was a little uh, dumbstruck that, that a hole in one didn't elicit some sort of understanding as to why I was late. But uh, yes, it was a little testy to begin with. And uh, that's the way we got going. I, I love that through the course of that story, you actually haven't mentioned your cricket performance. <laughs> which was scoring 100 against Pakistan and taking three for 34, I think, and basic – was it man of the match? Yeah, it was. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, yeah a good my, day. My, I mean, oh, it... so, so Nikki's side of the story was that you had this worldie, right? You scored 101 not out to win the game. You took three for 33. You were kind of – your best performance ever. You were kind of you know, new to the scene. You went out to a bar that, that night, and you were kind of the big dog in the town. You know, you, you got chatting to her. <laughs> Asked her, asked her, tried to get her number, and she said her line was, "Well, you're only as good as your last game. Let's see how you go next week." And then she said she sort of followed your your performance, and the next week you you're out for ten, and she sort of saw the call coming in and was wondering whether she should take it or not because you know you'd sort of set the bar quite high and then disappointed after that. Um. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, yeah, she's ninety five percent right. That's pretty pretty accurate. The thing is that. It was relatively new, but you had to hand your phone and phones in. I mean, that had some uh, sort of anti-corruption issues. So you had to hand your phones in when you got to the ground. So she did. She sent me a message. We'd played in Queenstown. Um, I hadn't made many. I don't know what I got. Um, but, uh, she, yeah. Oh, was it? <laughs> Ten. Okay, there we go. I told you it wasn't many. <laughs> uh, but, she, yeah, she's, uh, so she, she wouldn't give me a number that first night. But then she said, look, you know, uh, she sent a text to say, so I told you you're not as good as your last performance, which isn't very good, or something along those lines. And uh, and all I said was, yeah, well, now I've got your number. Um, look out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, your relationship seems very fun. Uh, she's obviously works for News Hub, um, and there, we've seen a few clips uh, when she went on national TV at the end of one of the weekly sort of sports segments to say how you'd forgotten your wedding anniversary, um, but then you'd gone on Facebook and you'd had a roast meal prepared by the time she yep. got back from shifts, kind of trying to sort of get one up on each other. Uh, she told us a story about the golf club prank you've recently done. Are you able to fill us in on that one? Uh, yeah, look, I think our relationship is, is based around that. We're trying to uh, be a bit humorous with the way the way things are you're quite right i mean I, we have an argument as to when our anniversary actually is whether it's our wedding anniversary which is the official uh, wedding that we had or um it's the third of january which was when we met so we sort of have two anniversaries but yeah there, there's been a few things a few pranks along the way uh and you're right she's nikki's just started taking uh, playing golf she's got a, a group of girls together and they play every week um so i got her some golf clubs for christmas but, um, you know, some Wilson golf clubs. Let me get that one out there. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, Wilson golf clubs, where they stop? <laughs> they were Wilson golf clubs. Best in the business, too, I might add, for the ladies. Um, and, uh, but, they're, you know, the, the covers are all pretty pretty bland and pretty plain. Uh, the clubs themselves are fantastic, but the, the, the covers themselves aren't. It's quite similar. So, yeah, I found an outfit in the U.S. Uh, that um, – you can, you know, send them a picture and then they put it over the top of your cover. So I've got a couple of 
couple of them made up, um, which are semi-humorous. One takes the piss out of her, one takes the piss out of me, actually. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the idea being that when she turns up onto the course with her friends and sits there and looks at it, um, you know, she she ends up getting a little embarrassed. You know, I got some some tights, some leggings for the gym made up, which was just my face all over them. Um, yeah, and that's pink. frightening. Yeah, and it, yes, exactly. And they were pink ones as well. So uh, she she turned up to Les Mills in Auckland, which is um, pretty popular. A lot of her friends are there and wearing these once. She said she'd do it once. But yeah, we, we tend to do that just to just to uh, keep it funny and keep it humorous. And it's um, yeah, I try my best for a few pranks uh, here and does, there. But uh, does, yeah, does it extend into international waters? Are you um, is she calling ahead to the hotel that you're checking in in India and <laughs> arranging some bits and pieces and vice versa, or is it restricted to uh, to the plus six four area code in New Zealand? Yeah, no, it is. It is. Yeah, no, nothing ever. Well, uh, she's not that clever. I don't. Know, she's she's left the room now, so she's not here. So <laughs> she's not that clever. She hasn't come up with anything uh, remotely close to, to 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 getting me or to being. She, you know, she thought she was clever. You're quite right with the, the to outing me and calling calling me out on, on TV around uh, missing the anniversary. She got in trouble with her bosses, I might add, as well for personalising it. But uh, uh, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't forgotten. But you're right. Yeah, uh, most of it's just uh, little things that you that you do just to uh, keep keep things funny and happy. Uh, we'll turn we'll turn the attention uh, back to cricket now. Um, so. Part of the your Wikipedia page is, is quite comprehensive. One of the first things on it is that your first ODI wicket was Sachin Tendulkar, and your first Test wicket was Brian Lara, which is yeah. a pretty decent scalp. So I'm kind of keen to unpack the Tendulkar wicket. Your first wicket being one of the greats of all time. Now, is that in your head? Are you thinking about bowling to him before your first game for the Black Caps? Like. Um. No, I don't know if you oh, – yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know what it's like for, for football. I'm a, again, I imagine it's the same for every sport. When you go to a new level, you wonder whether you're good enough to be at that level. You know, do I deserve to be here? I'm suddenly playing against players with big names. Um, they, I know these guys are amazing. They've had so much success in the past. So when I came into the Black Caps, um, I was wondering those, those very questions. But I've always believed that I was going to get to that – to that level so it wasn't so much of a a mental jump because I you know maybe falsely I've always believed the best sports people in the world are the best ones who are able to lie to themselves so you, you know you don't get you know you keep telling yourself that you, you're better than Ricky Ponting or you're better than Tendulkar and you deserve to be out here and and you know you're going to show them and you're going to be better than on the day and for whatever reason that has come pretty naturally um, to me whereas even my mum would tell you Everyone that I'm not as good as Tendulkar, I know that. But when I got on the field, I always thought I was at that level. So when you first get there, it's just proving to yourself that you are worthy and good enough to be there. And after that series, which was a five-game series, Roger Twos, you know, I'm wondering that question. We've just been hammered. or well, we, we lost 3-2, but, you know, the games we lost, they pretty much showed their class. But Roger Twos, who was, um, you know, a terrific player for New Zealand as well, he, he came and said, you're going to play 200 games for New Zealand and that was great you know that basically solidified in my in myself that I thought well you know I am good enough here's one of New Zealand's senior players a, a consistent performer and he had the I guess the the nicety to come up to me and tell me that he thought I was going to play 200 one day games for New Zealand and that was after five games and uh, and at that point if you're depending on your own personality again sort of felt like I belonged and right, now time to go out and try and be as good a player as you can be at that level and live up to what he had suggested, which was to play 200 games. So, you know, when you talk about Tendulkar, did I celebrate it? Yeah, I mean, he just hit one straight up in the air. It wasn't a, like a big swing delivery that nicked off and, you know, or anything clever like that. Um, you know, they were chasing 350 or thereabouts and, and therefore he had to go for it. So there was not a, a lot of skill in the bowling or anything like that. But, um, you know, it was more the fact of, Wow, I'm on the field with Sachin Tendulkar. Do I deserve it? I need to go and show that I am. So you do you do Tendulkar ODIs, you do Lara yeah. Test cricket. What's the yeah. hat trick for T twenty? Who's the first T <laughs> twenty wicket? Is it a, is it a, another big one? Absolute shitter. <laughs> no, I have no idea actually. I couldn't I find know. it. 
Oh, really? No, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We played. I played in the first one ever. That um, whatever we were, the beige ones, and against the you Aussies. Didn't ball though, did you? I oh, know. I can't remember, mate. Uh, this is the thing. I tell you what. I've been involved in many shows. We do. I mean, I work a lot in India, and they they keep making this this content, this color content. They're doing these shows in India, and they ask you little questions about your career. And I've sat there with Brendan McCullum, and they've asked him questions. Sangakara, Lara, um, you know, Brett Lee, all these big names, and nobody remembers much about their own career. I mean, you go, well, what happened when this? And, and, you know, Brendan McCullum, I remember, didn't even realise he he couldn't remember what ground he played at a World Cup. He couldn't remember if he'd ever played against Canada before. I mean, so some of these things that uh, when you look back, you just go, I've got no idea what happened in in these situations. So I know, I don't know. I don't know if I bowled in against the Aussies that day. I mean, I hope I didn't because they, they smashed us everywhere. Well, I'll, I'll, pull, I'll pull another little tidbit from that game, and that was Jeff Wilson had made a comeback to play for New Zealand. Yeah, it, that was because John Braceful loved his rugby. He just wanted to have someone to chat rugby with. So he said, well, I'll pick, I'll pick, I'll pick Super Jeff and get him into the team, and then I can sit there in the bar and have a chat about rugby. Well, uh, genuine, I think, genuine question. Was it, were there people looking around going, are we taking that? Well, I, know, I, know, I don't know if it was taken seriously, because I was at that game, and whichever Marshall came out with the big afro was glorious. That's right, and Hamish, up Hamish, the yeah. stuff. So did it feed into that kind of festival atmosphere, or was it a genuine, like, yeah, I'm going to give this a go? No, no, I don't think T20 was what it was. There's, there's, you know, geez, we're going to get serious here again for a moment. There's a couple of moments in, in cricket history that I personally think are almost sliding doors like they've, they've sent the game in different directions. The first was Kerry Packer with um, white ball cricket in the Rebel Series, World Series cricket in the, whatever it was, late 70s, 80. And then the second was India winning the World T20 uh, in 2007, I think it was. Up till then, T20 was considered a little bit Mickey Mouse was – uh, a bit of fun, but it wasn't really taken seriously. Um, but when they won the World Cup, all of a sudden, and when India wins something, they they really celebrate. And that's when the IPL came after that. So that game that you're talking about, which is around 05, maybe 06, somewhere around there, 06, uh, you know, it was still in that stage where it was just a bit of fun. Um, and you're right. So the guys got dressed up. I can't grow facial hair to save my life. So I tried to grow a beard and and a bit of a moustache, and it looked so bad, I ended up shaving it off on the morning of the game. But I couldn't look like the rest of the boys. I tried my best. Um, but you're right. I mean, the, the guys just had had some fun. Um, it was more, more, almost had a, an exhibition game feel about it. Uh, and, you know, the schools, of, I think Ricky Ponting smashed it to all, hit the top of the stand or put one under the roof. At one point, it was just crazy. Um, but that was that was where it all began, and it was uh, it was a great game to be a part of. Uh, and I and I've always been a T20 guy, and I could I could see what was coming after that of, of what could be, and it was uh, it was a lot of skill, a lot of fun. Players enjoyed it. I was I mean I wanted to delve into that T20 because you were I guess part of that original globe trotting group um, that sort of started to to pick up and play around the world. Just before we talk about that though. Um, I think you were in the first ever bowl off in a T20 game. Would that have been a better way to uh, decide the ODI World Cup final? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually involved. So, you know, you're right. It got so embarrassing. Uh, I don't know if people <laughs> remember, but everybody keeps missing. Look, I promise you, if we're at training, Nathan Astle, who everybody remembers for being the, the quality batsman that he was, uh, you know, as a bowler, he would just hit one stump after one stump after one. He'd never miss, never miss. And even he missed all three a couple of times. So everybody got nervous and it became embarrassing and the crowd started laughing at us when the West <laughs> Indies played us and we, and we bowled off. So that's why the ICC changed it. They just went, well, we can't have our players embarrassed because they can't hit the stumps with nobody standing there. So we had to try and come up with something else. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, the Super Over, I didn't, I didn't like the Super Over for the World Cup final. I just thought when you play a tournament for a month like that and you're going for eight hours in a day that it was probably better ways. Um, T20, I can understand, you know, that, that sort of sport, you need a winner. But, uh, yeah, the World Cup was I, was, I was working that game in India and it, uh, it killed me, I have to say. I, Got it. I, can't remember, I can't remember this bowl off. Were, were there rules about how fast you had to bowl? Like, could you slow it right no. down and, and just, just like literally the three stumps? Like, oh, you miss it. And you've got to yeah. hit them. <laughs> That's exactly it. I mean, you could, you could come in full speed, you could. 
uh, go off three three steps. You could do whatever you like. As long as you bowled the ball legally, you couldn't bowl a no ball or whatever. And guys were <laughs> missing it. And the players were all standing around together going, oh, my God. I, I we're, feel we're like it was only you and Shane Bond that hit. Yeah. But, I mean, I, look, it was. But um, it, you're giving me a bit too much credit there. Shane Bond hit both of his, which meant I only had to hit one. West Indies hit, didn't hit one at all. I mean, I could have missed mine as well, and we still would have won. Um, but it was, yeah. But it was an embarrassing night. But it was nice to, nice to be involved. I think we, we, I think we actually tied with the West Indies, the first two times we played them in a T20 in this country. And the first one was a bowl off, and the second one was the super over, um, where we got a bit of a Chris Gale special, and he took us down. But uh, yeah, it was the bowl off's embarrassing, and I'm glad they got rid of it. Um, look back to the IPL stuff and you've referenced it before with the Faf Duplessis stuff so when the IPL comes in all of a sudden cricket traditionally I guess had been national teams or playing domestically or if you're lucky enough you you got to play county stuff all of a sudden you get the best players in the world all playing for these franchises was that a bit of a surreal experience to be involved in that from the get go? Uh, Yeah it was Uh, again it was still uh, a lot of teams so cricket in India uh, it had a really strong link with Bollywood. So it, there was that entertainment aspect to it as well. So all the pre-shows and post-match shows had a lot of singing and dancing in it. The cheerleaders were there. So they tried to really jazz it up and make it entertainment. Um, and the players sort of thought about it that way as well. Now, the thing is, I mean, the, the IPL is just flying at the moment right now. It's just the, the viewing numbers are off the charts crazy. Um, you know, as football men yourself, there was an IPL game this season that outrated an EPL, an English Premier League game in England. So there was more people watching the IPL than an EPL game, which I found hard to believe. But that was that's how sort of big the tournament's become. But it's moved on what it was in those early days. We you know coming together into a dressing room. The team I came into, we had Adam Gilchrist and Andrew Simons from Australia. You know, we had Herschel Gibbs, Shahid Afridi from Pakistan. Uh, Chaminda Vas from, from Sri Lanka and then we had a, a young Rohit Sharma and Vivius Lakshman from India so we had um, a lot of these sort of world superstars and it was it was just a lot of fun coming together going out for dinner or having a drink with them in the bar on an off day where you just sit down and and, and talk cricket and learn uh, listening to different or watching them train learning how to you know try different things or, and what you found as well is if you were coming up against Murali Durham then Kumar Sangakara or Mahalo or Jai Wardner will be telling all of the other players how to play against Murali. Or if I'm playing against Shane Warne, Adam Gilchrist is saying, well, this is what you've got to look to do. This is what he's going to try and do. So very quickly, international players were giving secrets uh, out on their, on their teammates. And that wasn't the wrong thing to do. That just that happened because you were now part of a group and you were trying to win this tournament. And and you do whatever you can to win. And so the most enjoyable thing was, was just learning and and soaking in all the different experiences and the ways to, uh, to play cricket, ways to train cricket uh, with all these superstars from other countries. With the way that the game has gone and the money and T20 and the interest in the global audiences, what I'm not sure how much coaching you do or, or talking to young people. Do you advise, would you advise them to go to focus more on that style of game than the longer form? Like, is there, does there have to be a divide? Like, what, what is the messaging now to young kids coming through? I, I don't think the messaging has always ever, or ever been about money. I mean, it should always be around uh, what you enjoy the most. Some players are suited to certain uh, versions of the game to others. Um, you know, I always try and equate it T20 to test cricket. It's a little bit like playing at the French Open on clay versus, uh, you know, the grass at Wimbledon or the hard courts of, of Australia or New York, you know, they, they require different skills. They are incredibly difficult to master, and you have to these days anyway to, to master all three. Um, you have to be a pretty serious player. Um, so I, I, you know, players today. I played a lot of county cricket in England, and even there, uh, they won't admit it publicly, but they enjoy the T Twenty part of the season the most. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the same wasn't in New Zealand as well. Because um, at the end of the day, there's only 11 test match spots up for grabs, you know, you, whereas an IPL, there's 100 and, you know, there's 10 teams now. So there's probably 20 people in a squad. So there's so many more opportunities. If your face doesn't fit in this team, you can go to another team. And it's starting to become like a more uh, worldwide sport in the sense that, you know, you franchise and you can fulfill a role for a team. So 
um, there's more opportunity in, in T20 than there is necessarily playing test cricket where sometimes, you know, if the same 11 guys play all the time, then, um, you know, your whole career is for nothing. You're just going to play domestic cricket for, for 80 bucks a day or something silly like that. So, um, you know, it all goes hand in hand. It is your job, uh, but you should also have some fun when you're doing it and whatever that may be should be the direction you go in. Just zooming out on your career, from the outside, it looks like you had a sort of 20-year career. You crossed the divide from amateur to professional. Yeah. Great stats, great New Zealand career and things. Um, do you feel like you achieved your potential as a player? Like, is there anything that you look back on and think, I could have done that differently, it could have led me down a different path? Or is there anything you would change about how you went about your career? Um, oh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um... You ask a lot of players, they'll always say things like, I wish I'd trained better or I wish I'd uh, paid more attention to my fitness, wish I'd eaten better and all of those things. But you make those decisions when you play and you do what you think's right at the time. Um, my, my one is as simple as I wish I'd found more enjoyment in the game than I, than I did. You know, it very quickly became a job for me. And like most people, they had parts of their job that they don't like, uh, they despise even. And um, they sort of consider it a bit of a chore. And, you know, I, I sort of lament a little bit the fact that it became that very quickly for me. And there were times where I didn't really get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Um, and I wish I'd found a way to be able to do that, um, which people probably don't, would never believe to be true. They think, well, you're playing international cricket or you're playing sport for a living. How can you ever think that it's not a lot of fun? But um, there are certainly times where there was, don't get me wrong. But, you know, that's the one area where I, I think, um, if I'd found a way to have a bit more fun with things, I think potentially I could have actually put, uh, well, I feel I could have done a lot better at the, the international level. And I think if, if what, that was one way um, where potentially I could have perhaps reached that level. If, if you weren't enjoying it, did, were there any times across the 20 years that you came close to walking away? And did you consider any other walks of life? Like what would you have done if you'd walked away? Did it get that close? Um, no, I never really did. I was always relatively safe in all the teams that I played in. Um, there were times where you might be on the fringe, but that didn't really last that long. So, uh, and then, as you say, it broke. I also maybe went from amateur to the professional ranks in New Zealand, but um, it also was the T20 to, or being pre-T20 to one day cricket being sort of a big thing. And then T20 starting in England. I played eight seasons of county cricket in England, which was, you know, that was the one place where I did find a lot of fun because the guys didn't take it that seriously. And the reason they didn't is because they just played so much. So you just got out there and played. Um, and so the T20 came along and then it, yes, it did become a job, but you were playing the version of the game where you could go out and just throw bat at the ball and have some fun with it. So I, I always found more, more uh, joy in that, in that rather than, as much as I loved the bat and test cricket, it was, it was awesome. Um, the whole grind of fielding and bowling as well was uh, not quite as enjoyable. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough question to break down uh, when things were significantly different from when I started, even even in the middle years, to, to what they were at the end because franchise cricket came in, different version of the game, um, yeah, the fact that it was a job, but I knew it was a job. And there are times when you when you know it's a job, you've got to do things. You've got to do what's right. And and when you stop playing all the versions of the game and you're only white ball, you do have periods of time which we have big breaks. So making sure that you're, you're still fit enough to, to get the next contract is, is the challenge. And that can be a bit tough at times. So, yeah, hard question to answer. But the you know, it was it, by the very end, I, I, I mean, I was 39 and I was still playing as an overseas player for Leicestershire in, in England. And at 39, there's probably no way I should, should have been an overseas player. But um, I knew then that the time had come to, to pack it in because there wasn't one part of that that I was really enjoying that made you want to get up and try and be better. Yeah. It is a fascinating lifestyle. It's a little bit, I guess, like the the Rugby Sevens circuit where they're, they're, they're constantly yeah. on the go. And it, it, from the outside looking in, it does. It looks glamorous and it's it's this and it's that. But like you say, the reality of living out of a suitcase, being in hotel rooms, looking at the same faces every morning for breakfast or sitting and hearing the same jokes, you know, like sort of like you must get to the point where you go, if, we, if this fucking guy says one more time, good morning, Scotty, how are you? I'm going to punch him right in the face. Like, I can imagine the, the grind kind of gets to that stage, right? 
Uh, yeah, can do it. But I mean, that's where the T20 leagues, you know, there's one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And now there's T10. Now there's the 100 ball comp, which is in England. I mean, if you really wanted to, you can go down that path. And I did it for the last three years once I'd finished with New Zealand. So, you know, in some ways you had these little stages where it never became completely stale. Um, but, you know, I also enjoyed suddenly playing in new teams with new people against new opponents in different countries. So, you know, it was it did have its pluses as well. I'm making it sound worse than it was. There was a lot of parts to enjoy, but, um, you know, at the back of your mind, it was your job and you knew that this is what put food on the table. So you have to try and do it as well as you can. And, and am I right in thinking by the back end of the career, like the T20 stuff, the hopping from bit to bit, was actually more time away than when you were yeah, black cap? Probably. Yeah, it was close. I mean, I'm not quite sure it was as much, but, um, you know, I think you're right. It, there were times where... Uh, you would be away for months on end. And, yeah, it's not that healthy. It's not that healthy in your relationship. I had, I had a young daughter at that point who was probably five or six. Yeah, was she now 15, so probably eight years ago. So, yeah, around that age where it's not necessarily a good thing. So, you know, all of that suddenly plays on your mind. Like every sportsman, they go through that, don't they, about the fact that, you know, am I spending too much time away from home? Is it good for my relationship? So, um, you know, all of these things came into it and it was time to move on. I was lucky that I went into TV um, commentary in I think 2005 so I've been doing it for 16 17 years now and I did it for nine years while I was still playing um, which you know whilst the game got me a lot of shit from the rest of the boys because all of a sudden I'm in the dressing room and then the next game I'm talking about them um, it also gave me another career to move into post playing which uh, is always the tough part it's it's every sport where guys really struggle um, once they've they've left playing, especially when they've done it for a long time, to then suddenly turn around and have to try and find a new career in their mid-30s when they haven't done anything for a while, it can be tough. We've spoken to a number of guests now who have made the transition <laughs> from player to pundit, and they often say the hardest part is giving honest critiques of players that they were friends with or have played a lot with. I know in the past there was an incident when like Mark Richardson was blazing his trail and you didn't like what he had to say when you were a player. <laughs> But now that you're on the other side of that equation, have there been any challenging moments where players you know well perhaps haven't liked your comments? Yeah, well, it's happened. It happens a lot. Um, and whether they think it's fair or unfair, yeah, I guess they don't like it. The Mark Richardson one that you're talking about, I get on well with Mark. Mark's a good guy. But um, I was actually in the comment. So where that came from is there was a run out in Christchurch where Brendan McCullum ran out murally as he went to celebrate Kumar Sangakara's 100. Um, and I was in the commentary box at the time with Mark Richardson, and Mark Richardson had no problem with it. He said, look, you know, Murley's not adhered to the rules. It was a silly mistake, and but he, you know, that's what it was. It was a mistake, and he's out. So that was that. But then we had an incident in, in England where Grant Elliott was bowled over by Ryan side, side bottom, got basically flattened, and we got run out, and he got run out, which, uh, which, you know, made the game a lot closer than we actually won by one wicket and one run or whatever it was. Uh, but it caused major tension between the two teams where we were on the balcony sort of giving it to them and they were responding, England was responding as well. And then Mark Richardson came and said, you know, we had no right to be these, uh, to, to be holier than thou after our behaviour with the Murley run out where... I was there and I knew that he had no problem with it and yet now he was taking the opposite view. So I think as, as long as you, you know, if you're consistent with, with what you're saying, then, uh, you know, surely that, that's got to be enough. You know, in my view, this current New Zealand side is the best we've ever had. I mean, the results they've had over the last five or six years has been phenomenal. They've, uh, that they've just, you know, all the World Cup finals and, and then winning the Test Championship, I, I don't know how you can criticise them. They've they've been so good for so long. Um, but there are times, sure, where, you know, former teammates who are coaches get a bit antsy when when they, you might, they might hear something that they don't like. I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the world of the commentary. And <laughs> the, the, the part that particularly interests me is when somebody new comes into the commentary team. And <laughs> I imagine it's, it's, it's the same as if you're new coming into a sporting team where – there's nerves, you've kind of alluded to it before, of am I good enough to be here? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Like, is there any, uh, you know, meet on the ninth hole at nine o'clock sort of 
<laughs> banter or anything like that, like switching the mic, like switching the mic off. And there, like, no, no, there is. Yeah, well, no, there was one. So the the thing we do in India is called the dugout, which was uh, a lot of fun. It's basically trying to mirror sitting on the sideline in a dugout whilst the game's going on. But we we do things slightly differently. I won't go into what it is exactly, but we have all the big names. You know, I'm one of the two hosts, and then we have a lot of the the big names, the, as the names I mentioned earlier, Kevin Peterson, Graham Smith, Brett Lee, Brian Lara, all these guys come in and they're able to explain what's going on, do demonstrations and, and all of this sort of thing. But when we have Kevin Peterson and Graham Smith in the commentary with you, they will do exactly that. They'll turn your, your microphone up in your ear so it just blows your head off or they'll turn you on mute, they'll rip the cords out, they'll steal your answers. So often you'll, you'll have your pre-show ready to go um, and... <laughs> You know, I'm going to ask you about this. I'm going to ask you about this. And then they'll steal each other's answers to leave them on live TV. They'll leave them hanging and high and dry. Now, some people don't like that and uh, and others don't really care. So there's a little bit of that. It's about getting the right people because you don't want to annoy anybody or piss anybody off. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you, I mean, you, you're right. We've, we've had Brenda McCullum, Mike Hesson. Uh, we had Ross Taylor and Tim Southey join us this time around because they weren't involved with the IPL. Uh, and they were nervous, you know. There was certainly um, Baz when he first did it, but uh, and Ross and Tim recently. But you just, you know, you just like we're doing. We just sort of sit down and fire some questions backwards and forwards, and and you just come on their experience. But um, it, it can be it can be a bit of fun at times as well. It's always good. Uh, Jimmy Pamant said that you you had one of the sharpest cricketing minds. Um, obviously, Ooh. great punditry, but did you ever consider is coaching something that you'd ever consider? Or nah. Jimmy's made a Jimmy's made a bloody a good living out of a fielding coach. Surely there's a market for a, a slogging coach or something in the IPL. <laughs> yeah, that you yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, someone who can pack the bags or something, I might be able to help with. But that would be it. I would have thought. Uh, no, I don't know. I don't know. I've always thought uh, leadership was people whose personality are, are pretty even. You know, when things are going well, they don't get too high. When things are going poorly, they don't get too down. And th- that's what makes a good captain in cricket because they have so many decisions to, to make on the field. I think coaching is exactly the same. I think you've got to be pretty level. Your ability to um, relate with the players playing well and those who aren't or if you've just lost a few games in a row, um, then you, you need to be pretty as a natural personality. You see it with Kane Williamson. Stephen Fleming, who was the best captain I played under, was like that. Brendan McCullum as well, Dan Vittori, all those guys were all pretty level. Um, that's probably not my street. And um, so I don't think being in a leadership role then as a coach, you may have some information and, and things you can pass on, but you've still got to be good for the team environment. And I'm not sure if, if someone's a bit more uh, on, the, uh, on the emotional side, it's a, on the roller coaster, it's a good thing. Uh, for a team environment, so maybe as a consultant or helping out on the side, but um, you know, a team and team dynamic, you need to be in harmony. And James Pamant was very good at that himself, so uh, probably not my street. But Jimmy, Jimmy's right in terms of the, the sharp cricketing mind because you you do you're in high, high demand for these kind of pundit and these cricket roles. So that must be, I guess, a, a satisfying thing as well that you, you keep getting asked about. You mentioned a 15 year career behind the microphone. That's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's been good fun. I mean, I, in India, you've got to understand that the dynamic there is just about big names. And so the, the boss at Star, which is their, Star Sports is their equivalent of Sky, like we have in New Zealand, he called me into his office and he said, look, I'll tell you what, we'll give you, a, we'll give you a go. I know you've done some commentary in New Zealand, but we'll give you a go here and then I'll work out whether, uh, whether, we, whether I think you're any good and whether we'll get you back. But... The reason you're here, make no bones about it, is because you shared a dressing room with MS Dhoni and therefore you can tell MS Dhoni's stories to our audience. So that was the only reason I got a job in India was simply because I happened to share a dressing room with a, a genius of a player and I could tell stories about him. But that's what it, you know, that's what India's like. They just uh, love the fact that, you know, they, they're heroes. They have a very hero culture, a very hero mentality. Um, and these these big name players are exactly that. So if if they can get more personal stories out about these guys, then that's what they like. That's the sort of content they like on their TV and their coverage. Um, and simply being in the same dressing room got me an opportunity to get in the door, and and I've been there for a while. That's why we got you on too, Scotty. Actually, yeah, <laughs> talk rubbish for a long time. 
build, build our profile in India if we could. It'd be that'd be amazing. Um, you know, just just on India though, like I've been there once with an all whites team, and I'm always fascinated to to unearth um, stories from India. But are, are you able to go out and move around, or are you very much hotel ground, hotel ground? If you move around, you're getting mobbed. Um, uh, well, you are. Yes, you are. I mean, uh, another those same four players, myself. Faf Duplessis, Tim Southey and Albie Morkel, when we went to a, the, the local shopping mall in Chennai, we just turned up and the, the security just came running at us uh, as soon as we turned up to the shopping mall and they just started abusing us. They said, you just can't do this. You cannot turn up unannounced like this. You must ring two hours in advance so that we can bring extra security in just so that we can go wandering around the shops or go to the food court or, or whatever it is. So, yeah, there's a and, – and that's as overseas players. The local Indian guys – I mean, Tendulkar can't go outside. There was always stories of him having to put disguises on just to be able to walk around in the streets so that no one recognised him. Um, and, the, and, it, and it is like that. It's a, it's a real hero culture. It's worse at the moment, of course, with COVID and the fact that all the guys are in bubbles. You can't leave – you know, when I go over there for a month or two, we're stuck on the floor of our hotel and that's it for that length of time. So you can't get out, um, but you, you do have a bit more freedom uh, But as a player. But, you know, the bigger the name you are, you just you just can't move. I mean, you just have hundreds of people around you in seconds and <laughs> it's it's not that enjoyable and it's tough for the, for the guys trying to run wherever you are, whatever place you're at. The, the IPL obviously got cancelled last year. Where, where are things at now with you? You're back in Auckland. Are you trying to go back over there if it starts up again or is it a bit of a holding pattern or yeah it's it, well two yeah two things one of course yeah i'd love to i'd love to be going back it's a bit tough with the inability to get back in the country that makes it that makes it hard but then i also start a new business i'm going to be a, a stop go man i'm going to be one of those on the side of the road lollipop man on the traffic you know when you're walkie talkie through to say go i'm going to be yeah. one of those from march um, okay. Down in Hamilton, actually, I'm going to be in the, oh, yeah. the Waikato. Yeah, 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 we're coming down to Hamilton. So, um, uh, so yeah, that starts in March. So I'll either be back over there in India or standing on a stop go sign, uh, waving you through. So if you see me, you got to make sure you say hello as well. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> True story. So the, stop, the stop go is you. You you've started a business as a stop go. Yeah, consultant, yeah, yeah. You, you... Oh, consultant. <laughs> 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 yeah, mate, you stand there with your sign and it says go and then you turn it around and it says stop. Yeah, that's probably the extent of the consulting that I could do. Uh, yeah, traffic management is what it is. So, um, yeah, yeah, we are in that process of, of setting up. Are you allowed to say who you're working for or is it, is it are we keeping on the oh, It's a brand new, brand new company. Brand new oh, company. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we're coming into the Waikato. Oh, we look forward to them yeah. the podcast. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully hopefully, I can maybe get my signs out and then get to India as well and do some TV stuff and then come back and get my signs out. So, yeah, be kind and be nice when you're driving past. Yeah. I'm, I'm I, I, ask can, you too. I can only speak from experience. I'm always very considerate to, <laughs> to, those, to those people on our roads, ensuring that yeah. we move safely and at the right speed, particularly in summer. Good. There we good. go. Hey, saying all the thankless, right things. Thankless, thankless mm -hmm. job in summer. We, uh, yeah, we'd love to catch up. Make sure you give us a bell when you're down. Um, we always say this to guests. We always say, let's catch up for a drink, but I don't think we've caught up with anyone yet, but maybe you'll be the first one. <laughs> well, I understand why you wouldn't with DevSitch, but the rest of them, it's a bit disappointing. Yeah, yeah true story. <laughs> um, Shay hates it when I do this, but I'm going to say, Shay, anything left on your list? I do have a couple of things left on my list. One is very <laughs> niche content, and I found myself... Oh, wow listening to Scott Styrus on a fantasy baseball podcast last night. And what? it's just, Oh, really? It's an interesting yeah. avenue to go down that you had been identified by this American guy to talk about how your league was going. Yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you still a fantasy baseball guy? Because that's quite no, a... No, no. No, the guys... So, no, no. We, well, we were still playing cricket at this point. So, it was Dan Vittori, Jacob Orham, Daryl Tuffy, Peter Fulton, James Franklin. I'm trying to think who else of the cricketers was there. We were all, yeah, we were all playing. We we're all playing in this fantasy league, and there's been a couple of other guys join in, and and in our in our tours as well. We played in the US at one point, and we uh, were supposed to throw out the pitch, uh, the, the ceremonial first pitch to a Miami Marlins in the 
Arizona game back in 2010 and, and have a hit out on the field. Yeah, we were supposed to do all of that. Um, and then, I, I can't remember, but yeah, Al Melchior was his name. And he, was, he was part of CBS in the US. And then he's gone out on his own um, for a few reasons. Uh, and so, yeah, I did an interview with him around fantasy baseball and, and how it's all going because we were pretty – we were into it. We were – because when we were at home, we were at home, right? So there were guys looking at it literally for seven hours a day. And, <laughs> and you know, it was almost full time. It was full time for our guys. Um, I don't play – they still play on it actually. But, uh, yeah, a couple of boys started cheating. And, mate, hey, there we go. Stick with the rules. Um, yeah, I said enough, enough. I'm out. So <laughs> – the other, the other niche area, the other niche area. Is, uh, it's, a, um, it's a specialist area of mine. So I lived in Papua New Guinea for two years. And oh, I gather yeah, okay. you went up and played there. And I'm just curious as to for what reason did you go and play there? Because Dipak was the a, was a coach there when I was there. Ah, okay. Well, I've been up there twice. Uh, I have been up there twice. And it wasn't – well, we did play. We had a, a sort of a mini tournament at the end. But the purpose was merely just to spread the cricket word really. I mean, PNG, a, a bit of an emerging nation to a degree. Um, they've got some really talented guys. It's been awesome to, to sort of watch those guys. And some of them are still playing from when I went up there twice. Uh, but again, same thing. You know, we had Carl Hooper from the West Indies, Graham Hick from England. Uh, i trying to think who else would have, would have gone over there. Uh, Robin Smith, a former English player. So there was a whole group of us that, that went up. Maybe Dooley, actually. Simon Dool might have gone up too at, at one point. In fact, he did. Um, so we went up there and then what we would do is we would spread out across the country and go and teach cricket and um, to the locals and try and grow the game um, and then come together for this tournament with all the best players at the back end. Uh, and it was, it was so much fun. It was awesome. Once again, for the fact that we were mixing with those guys and telling stories, but then watching the, the local guys. And, and one of the best things we did was actually go into a prison in Papua New Guinea and teach cricket, which we were all really nervous about. But there was a, it was an open prison. It was literally the doors were open and, and they could come and go if they wanted to. Um, and so we just threw the plastic stumps down, the bats, the tennis balls, and the guys in, in prison, all the prisoners, had an absolute ball. And it was, it was probably one of the most enjoyable things, uh, you know, that I've done was, was going into that prison and, and, you know, chatting to one guy who'd been in, he'd been in jail since he was 16 and he was, 61 or two at that point and he just said look you know I've I came in I've been in here 40 odd years um I don't have any family uh if I left I don't get any food I've got three meals here I've got a bed and so he basically just decided to live in prison and he and he stayed there so there were all these amazing stories from going up to Papua New Guinea um which I did twice to to go off to different parts and and learn a bit and, and that, those sorts of things. Kuwait was another place that I went and, and did exactly the same thing. Uh, we stayed at the building that was bombed in the uh, um, Kuwait war or the, you know, in 1990 or something like that. Uh, so, you know, that's the beauty of, of, of sport too, is that you do get to go to these different places and particularly cricket, because there's so many third world countries that play it, that you, you go to places that you wouldn't otherwise go and Papua New Guinea and Kuwait and places like that are, are two of them. That's a cool little nugget, Shay. I'm glad you you got your niche questions in. We've actually got a big. Uh, I think we're the number one sport podcast in Papua New Guinea. So that's a true, a true story. That's a true story. Which for a rugby league mad nation is big props to us. So they'll they'll enjoy that. Um, well, Chris Amini's still in charge up there. He's a, he's a gun player. So I hope he uh, I hope he's still learning and teaching the boys up there what they're doing. We'll tag him. We'll yeah. tag him in. Yeah, hundred yeah. hey, percent. That's been brilliant, mate. Th thanks so much for giving us your time. Um, a lot of fun across that uh, chat. Um, highs, lows, everything in between. Shay, last words? No, I, I, I love these kind of episodes where you you see a guy, you see them on the field, and then you have a conversation, you unpack all the different sides of it, and you see what lights them up. You see where the trials and tribulations have been as well, and, and there's some nuggets of information for people starting their sporting journey um, or coming towards the end of it and transitioning out. So really cool stuff. Look forward to seeing you on the streets of uh, Hamilton. With the, uh, with the you will. And, yep. uh, and we'll catch up for a, a drink or a beverage of some sort sometime soon. Mate, that'll be good. Sounds good. Cheers, guys.